Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to 1,000 Words, The Power of Visual Storytelling. This Pen World Voices event is moderated by Jonathan Ames. He is the author of eight books, including Wake Up, Sir, and the graphic novel The Alcoholic, which was illustrated by Dean Haspiel. His latest book, The Double Life is Twice as Good, a collection of essays and fiction, will be out in the summer. Jonathan Ames also created the forthcoming HBO television show, Bored to Death, and his novel, The Extra Man, was recently shot as a film. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jonathan Ames. So welcome again to uh, Cooper Union and today's program, 1,000 Words, The Power of Visual Storytelling. As was just said, uh, my name is Jonathan Ames, um, and uh, I thought they would have my funny book cover up there. You can put that up there so we can get this off to a bibulous start, uh, the cover of my book. We'll have a moment of silence while that happens. All right. Um, so let me just read what Penn would like me to read. Um, on behalf of the 3,400 writers, translators, and editors of Penn, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth annual Penn World Voices Festival of International Literature. To further Penn's mission to advance literature, defend free expression, and foster international literary fellowship, the festival brings together writers from across the globe for a truly international literary and cultural exchange. Before I introduce each of our guests, I have a short housekeeping announcement. Um, if you could all turn off your cell phones and um, computers and laptops and anything like that. Uh, while you do that, I thought just to um, have things be a little absurd, I'll make a sound, uh, which I'll then make at the end of the program, so you'll know when things begin and when things end. And uh, this sound is a sound my friends and I would make on the playground when being attacked by more normal children. And uh, it's called the Harry Call, as in Harry going crazy, it was the 70s. So I'll do one loud one to sort of clear the air, like striking a Buddhist bell at the start of a ceremony. And then I'll do one at the end, and you can go back out into the beautiful day. But so here's a Harry Call while you continue turning off your cell phones, because there's at least two people that haven't yet, probably. <laughs> OK. So here's a Harry Call to get us in a meditative state of mind. <laughs> So I'm, I'm quite proud to be able to do that sound here where Abraham Lincoln and Barack Obama both have spoken. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to read the bios of our three uh, wonderful participants. And what's going to happen is I'm going to read the bios. And then um, I'm, we're going to have each individual talk about their work briefly, just uh, you know, on their own, less of a discussion. Um, and then I'll open it up to general questions that I will give to our panel. And we'll have a talk. Uh, in front of you, uh, which I hope you'll enjoy. And then at the end, we'll open it up to uh, Q&A. But let me first read the bios. <clears throat> uh, Emmanuel Guibert, is that the cr correct pronunciation? It's Guibert. perfect. OK, I was an au pair in Paris. I was a male au pair in 1984, so I have a, <laughs> some uh, familiarity with the French language. OK. <laughs> Emmanuel Guibert was born in Paris. He has created many works for children and adults, including the graphic novels, Alan's War, the memoirs of G.I. Alan Cope, and with Joan Safar, the Sardine in Outer Space series, and The Professor's Daughter. Guibert's most recent book is The Photographer, which has been translated around the world and will be published in the US in paperback this May. It recounts the story of a Doctors Without Borders mission in Afghanistan through the eyes of a great phot photojournalist, the late Didier Lefebvre. Uh, David Polanski uh, was born in Kiev in 1973, and his family immigrated to Israel in 1981. Polanski graduated with honors from the prestigious Be Bezalel Academy of Art. I hope that's close enough. Yeah. OK, I'm doing well with these other languages. <laughs> and design in Jerusalem. His illustrations appear in all the leading Israeli newspapers and magazines, and his work in children's book illustration have won many awards. 
Polanski was also the art director and lead artist for the acclaimed animated film Waltz with Bashir, which won the Golden Globe Award and was nominated for an Academy Award in the Best Foreign Film category this year. He teaches illustration and animation at the Bezalel Academy. Um, Sean Tan, our last panelist on the far right, was born in Fremantle, Western Australia in 1974. He is the internationally acclaimed author and illustrator of The Lost Thing, The Red Tree, and the award-winning New York Times bestseller, The Arrival. His most recent work, Tales from Outer Suburbia, is an anthology of 15 short illustrated stories. In 2001, Tan won the Best Artist category at the World Fantasy Awards, and he is also the winner of the Children's Books Council of Australia Picture Book of the Year Award for The Rabbits with John Marsden. He also has worked with Blue Sky Studios and Pixar, providing concept artwork for films. He lives in Australia. So let's hear it for our three panelists. Okay, we can remove my book cover. I'm, I'll mention it again in a moment of self-promotion. But and can we see some of, of Emmanuel Guibert's work on on the screen? No. Nope. Okay, that's still from the alcoholic. Good move. But okay, yep, still. Oh, um, you are. Yes, the, the the photographer. If you want, we can have the cover, and you know, we can have some more images while Emmanuel speaks. So I thought what I would ask each panelist while their art is on the screen is in comic books you know with superheroes anyway there's often an origin story you know how spider-man became spider-man you know he got bit by a spider and the radioactivity happened and so i was wondering what is the origin story for you in in making this book the photographer for the photographer as for alan's war which was the previous book it's a story of friendship um, I had the privilege to have two very good friends and, uh, and the, the misfortune to lose both of them. But um, I first met Alan in Alan Cope in 1994 on a tiny island off the Atlantic coast of France. And uh, we became the very best friends on earth. I just by chance asked him for my way in the street. And uh, afterwards he started to tell me about his memories of uh, the California of the, he was born in 25 in, in Alhambra, which was a suburb of uh, Los Angeles and now has been swallowed by the big city. And um, he, so he told me his souvenirs, his, his memoirs, sorry. And, um, and I started to, to produce pages about them uh, with him. I used to show them to him. And, um, and it started to be published, etc., and it circulated, and now it's translated in English, which is uh, quite surprising for me. Uh, of course, when we met each other in this little shack on the island where I met him, we were far from imagining that it would make such a way. And um, a few years earlier, when I was 14, I met Didier Lefebvre, who was my neighbor in Paris, who used to live in the same building. And uh, at the time I was 14, he was 21. He was studying biology, and we would meet in the entrance of the, in the hall of the building and uh, exchange some words, and I, he would tell me about his job. And he liked to travel, so as a biologist, he started to do some missions for the um, NGO uh, Doctors Without Borders in, in France. And uh, his first mission took, took place in the Horn of Africa. And after a while, he used to carry with it, along with him all the time a camera. And the camera bit by bit replaced the, the tools for the biology. And he became a professional photographer. And uh, time passed. And one day in 1998-99, I asked him whether we could spend the time together and to tell ourselves what we were doing in life. And he invited me home for lunch. And after this lunch, I asked him if he would be kind enough to choose for me uh, a mission among the 20 years of mission he had done uh, in his professional life. And, um, he and tell it, just tell it to me. He disappeared in his studio and he came back with a few boxes. And he put these boxes on my knees and opened them. And I saw uh, contact sheets. And he started to point at these contact sheets explaining me what was on them, what was on the pictures. 
And uh, I've been struck by the fact that the contact sheets morphologically look a lot like uh, comics pages. It's mm -hmm. images side by side with people in them leaving a story. And if you're lucky enough to have the photographer by your side explaining you what's within the images, you, you, you can experiment a, a vivid story in, in front of you like that. So during this afternoon, I, I have spent a very, very interesting afternoon in which I've learned a lot of things. I, I asked some questions, but remained silent most of the time because he was obviously talking a lot. But uh, I was boiling ins inside, and at the end of the afternoon, I said, you, you've just showed me uh, 4,000 photographs. It was 130 pages of a contact sheet. And how many of these pictures have you uh, published, actually? And uh, he said, oh, I've been very lucky because I have published six of them. And uh, it was uh, when he came back in 86 and he made a, a double page in a French newspaper and he was, that was one of his first professional missions, so he was very proud about that. But all the rest finished in these boxes from which they weren't uh, supposed to get out ever again. So I felt there was an injustice in that. Uh, because I felt that the whole story, to be well told, needed much more images. So I started to figure out a way to show more pictures of this story to, 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 to make them circulate and to tell them to a public. And of course, being a comics author, I felt that maybe mixing my drawings and text with his photographs would allow us to fill in the blanks between the, between the photographs so the reader would arrive at the edge of each photograph knowing exactly what's going on in them so they would keep they would have the whole power of meaning and uh, um, of striking to to the reader so uh, so i started do, to doing that uh, it took me a long while to find a, a graphic style that would go well with the photographs because in the very beginning, uh, all my drawings, I had to throw them away. They would never fit, they would never connect with the pictures, considering that a photograph and a drawing are two medias that don't want to be together very easily. There's always one trying to kill the other when you look at a, a, a drawn picture and a, a photograph side by side. So in the end, I tried to, to f I, I, I finished with a simple, very simple way of drawing, you know, with this, these pictures that you see here. And, um, and we, started the, we started the adventure, and it has been published in three volumes in France. And we, were, we weren't expecting a marvel. Uh, we, we thought uh, it's a hybrid form, mixing f photographs and drawings, so it may be a little intimidating for our readers. So I was hoping that maybe 2,000, 3,000 readers would follow us. And on the contrary, it's been a boom. Uh, we've been very, very well uh, welcomed in, by the by the, the medias and by the, the public, and in, in doing so, I realized that people had uh, a hunger, a thirst for uh, facts of contemporary history, if someone would take the correct space and the correct time to tell them uh, facts of contemporary history as they are treated in the medias are very fast, going very fast with such a short space to, to talk about each of them. But uh, if, uh, like it's the case here, 230 or 300 pages are devot devoted to a subject, in this case, four months of a mission in Afghanistan in 86, you really have the time to tell a lot of things. And um, so now we we'll have been lucky enough to be translated in a lot of f foreign languages. And um, it's an occasion for uh, the photographs of this uh, very talented man, Didier Lefebvre, was um, talking about him at the past tense because unfortunately he died of a heart attack in 2007 at the age of 49. But uh, we now have the opportunity to make these pictures circulate and um, that's one of the good things that happened after the rehearsal of these, uh, these books. Thank you. Um, just <clears throat> Um, two quick questions before I, I move on to uh, David Polanski. 
Uh, and Alan's war is very much a, por a portrait of Alan Cope. And so both as someone who draws, you know, you drew this portrait, um, and you kind of took his life story. Um, is Didier also a character in The Photographer in the same way that do you tell his story, or is it purely the story of what was going on in Afghanistan in 86? Alan's War is a book about memory. Mm -hmm. So he's really like sitting beside, like I did in fact, in this, the little shack I told you about. Uh, there was a table, two chairs, uh, a few bottles of beers and coke, and we, we, would, we would be there uh, one month each year and exchange a lot of letters and tape recordings, and etc. And uh, so it's in the past tense. It's like someone really searching through his memory and, and telling you the result of this research. Um, on the contrary, Didier, uh, Didier's story is at the present tense, and it's really like a diary. I mean, my, uh, my idea was that you, you could be beside him and maybe within him in certain sense, because it's, he says I in the book, and we... It's, you, it's like being in his mind. So these two exercises are different because these two men were pretty different from, uh, from each other. I think every time you dedicate a biography to someone, you have to be very attentive to who this person is and what kind of treatment her, his testimony deserves. So that makes the two stories very different. Uh, one is meeting an old man and spending time with him, uh, uh, exploring the memory and, and the lack, the, the holes in the memories and etc. And the, the other one is to meet a younger man, he's 29 at the time of the story, discovering the world and uh, discovering uh, an area, a part of the world where he has never been before and sharing with him his, uh, his discoveries, his impressions day by day. Thank you. I, uh, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, Alan's War is quite beautiful and, and, and sort of a love letter to this man, which I think is kind of and not always the biographer's goal, but uh, it's a very beautiful portrait that you created uh, of him. And I like that the inspiration for both these books was friendship in some way, um, you know, creating, you know, keeping these men alive in these books. So that's quite beautiful. Um, if we could have images of David Polonsky's work up on the uh, screens now. And David, if you um, could tell me, you know, the origin story of how you came to, I guess, co-create a uh, waltz with Bashir. Um, it's amazing how, how similar and different uh, this, uh, what Emmanuel told uh, just uh, now about the photographer and the story of Waltz with Bashir. Um, it, it's um, the story is of Ari Fulman, uh, who's uh, quite well known in Israel as a screenwriter and director. And I've cooperated with him once uh, on a, um, in short animated clips for a documentary series. It was called "The Material That Love Is Made Of." Um, um, can people hear David all right? Uh, if you could speak closer to the okay. mic. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, so we've worked once before together on a um, documentary series for, for TV that had little bits of uh, animation in it. And after we finished that project, we met uh, at the cafe in Tel Aviv. And he said that, um, told me, you know, I, I dealt with everything in my life through film. And that's kind of true. He's one of those people. His first film was about his bad experience in high school. Um, Second one was uh, about the Holocaust, this very macabre action film. Mm -hmm. And that's because his, his kind of classical second generation, um, his parents were basically married on, the, on their way to Auschwitz or something like that. Um, he's, uh, he, he closed the score uh, with these love affairs through that documentary series, and he said that there was one thing that he just couldn't find a way to deal with, and he realized that it's, it's a very important experience in, in his life, and that's the war in Lebanon in, in 82, and to be more exact, the fact that he doesn't remember anything about himself taking part in it. He said that he'd look at pictures of himself from that time, and he, he knows that that's him, but he doesn't recognize the guy. 
so he said, how about making an animated feature film about that? And I said, yes, of course. Um, well, because just the prospect of uh, illustrating someone else's memory is it's very intriguing, very interesting. And the other reason is just the chance to work on an animated uh, feature film, uh, which comes in Israel every 40, 50 years. So <laughs> I just grabbed the chance. And later, uh, during the work on the film, uh, which um, involved a crew of, uh, started out with 10 people, ended up with 15, uh, my job was to come up with the visual approach for the, for the work and, and do most of the drawings, characters and backgrounds, like 80% of the drawings. I had a, a number of um, illustrators and animators working with me. Um, and in, in the middle of the work on the film, we were approached by an editor from Metropolitan Books in New York who read about the project and thought that it could be uh, reworked into a graphic novel form. And this again struck me as an interesting experiment because it would be like working against the grain, going from animation to comics. Um, and what we did there is, is use the concept art from the film, not sampling the animation, but using existing drawings to tell a story, which is a very awkward way to put, to put together a graphic novel. Um, so yeah, that's basically the story of Walter Bashir. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that is fascinating because obviously of late, um, you know, graphic novels or comic books have gone to movies and this was a case of something conceived of as a film then going, uh, becoming a graphic novel. Um, wh why did um, Ari feel that um, you know, animation or drawings would be the way to tell this autobiographical tale of lost memory? There is a number of reason, reasons, but most of all I think it's just uh, the ability to show things that don't have any uh, physical existence. That's memory, hallucination, <laughs> dreams, and um, there's this kind of metaphor that it can be used. If you, if you want to make a calculation, uh, yeah. So you, you write the numbers to multiply on a piece of paper. Now you have the technology in your, in your head, so why right. do you need to draw right. to write them down? And that is in a way to turn yourself in, into a third person. And I think that this is what drawing does in many ways. It, it helps the narrator ter, turn himself into a third person. And uh, the interesting thing that he says about his character in the film, uh, that now when he looks at, at the drawing of himself at 19, he can relate to this person. He knows that that's, that's him, although he doesn't look actually the way he really did look mm. like in, in that time. That's interesting. I, what, what it brings to my mind is this idea since he, for whatever reason, blocked these memories, and, and so it would be strange to take these blocked memories and then turn it into film because it would almost make it too real to recreate it that way. So you almost have to recreate it as drawings or as you say, figuring something on a piece of paper, which also makes me think um, one night with my friends, we have sometimes have this video camera at our parties, you know, narcissistic, <laughs> enjoying our ramblings and videotaping them. But I said one night, we're like cavemen drawing on the walls. You know, we're trying to remember what's happened uh -huh. and, uh, or to record what's happened, which seems to be very much um, you know, the mission of an artist is to record what's happened, sort of like the way the cavemen once drew on the side of the walls their adventures. Um, anyway, just a, a thought to put out there in the middle of the day. Um, okay, well, let's move on to Sean Tan. Um, if we could have Sean Tan's um, artwork on the screen. Um, and Sean, if you could, uh, I think this will probably be from The Arrival. Um, I don't. Oh, we'll get up there. Oh, that's right. You had a separate CD. It'll happen in a moment. But if you um, could tell us, you know, the origin story, how you came to create this work. Mm -hmm. um, well, first thing I want to say is, is what a great panel because uh, just listening to you guys, I, and echoing what David said, there's so many similarities in the way we approach the medium and um, what we're doing, particularly, uh, well, one thing about Walls with Bashir is the use of photography at the end, um, which I found really jolting and so perfectly logical in the same way it is with your work as well. 
And uh, with the arrival, I was inspired originally by photographs. And um, very much like those contact sheets, um, I often look at old photograph albums and think, you know, this is so like a picture book or comic, you know, and uh, I'm quite used to um, having to defend my own work because um, it's somewhat marginal um, in many ways, firstly being a science fiction illustrator uh, as my background, um, secondly working um, in children's literature, which is often, you know, you're sort of fighting to get a certain amount of literary respect. and. Also, uh, in the medium of picture books, which is where I really see my work. So I see the arrival as an extended picture book. And um, working in that medium, um, I'm often trying to find ways of reaching new audiences and uh, getting adults to look at picture books in particular. And I realise that um, everybody looks at picture books because, and in fact, a lot of people have made their own picture books and they're called photo albums. And it's a roughly chronological story about someone's life and it works very much like a good picture book because the images don't really narrate the story, they stimulate your memory and you project stuff onto those images and your world exists in the gap between images. Um, the arrival itself is a, a immigrant story. Um, I guess it's most notable for having no words in it but uh, in the original conception of it, it was a much smaller picture book um, about 32 pages long with some text in a very conventional way. And uh, the process of doing research and reading immigrant stories led me to decide on a longer format and to dispense with language because I felt that the moment you started to use English, um, the story stopped being universal. The characters looked like they came from an English speaking country. And um, the core of the, the book was the idea that uh, to tell a really good immigrant story and to really empathise with the character, um, you would need to actually go to a country that you've never seen before. So um, I started off being interested in the post-war experience of immigrants coming to Melbourne and Sydney in Australia. And um, also my father's story, um, he's Malaysian Chinese, he came to Perth in Western Australia which is like the most, one of the most isolated cities in the world. Um, to study architecture and he met my mother and um, ended up staying in Perth. Um, so I was sort of interested in his experience because it's so different from my own suburban childhood. Um, but also reading his, or talking to him about his background and then that leading into other people's stories, I realised um, that, uh, that um, you know, I wanted to contain all of those stories somehow and that I would have to create a fictional world and um, instead of actually creating something like Melbourne or Perth, I would ha I'd have to show a world that was really strange, like what it is actually like for somebody who doesn't speak the language, who doesn't know cultural behaviour, um, details about architecture, how to get around, how to cook and eat food, stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was sort of a world building exercise and a journey into some science fictional world. And um, in many ways, I think it was uh, me looking for a story that would fit um, my own way of thinking, um, and that is as an artist, uh, I think, and drawing, the act of drawing is about defamiliarising yourself with everyday objects. So when you draw, say, a glass of water, you don't think of it as a glass of water, you look at it as almost this magical phenomenon that you might never have seen before, and you draw it as a series of abstracted shapes and then at the end of it you revisit it and realise it's a glass of water but you've had some sort of enlightenment about that object and I feel that that experience is very similar to the experience of immigrants um, that they are like artists, they see the world like an artist because nothing is taken for granted, um, everything is new, everything has to be processed often purely in visual terms without sound or language and um, so all of these different factors kind of came together and uh, became an ideal, well, suggested a voice for a particular kind of story. And um, once I realised the basic structure of the story and the medium, I felt compelled to work on the arrival and it took me about five years to do, um, but I felt it was a necessary book to do because it seemed like such a good idea, it was such an obvious idea. And Thank some of these other images are from a... Um, another book called Tales from Outer Suburbia. Um, it often deals with similar themes to the arrival in the sense of people living on the outside 
of a world that is otherwise familiar, um, but sort of treated in a, in a much lighter and more colourful way, I think. Um, one thing I, I noticed in reading the arrival, though it's interesting to use the word reading, because as you said, there are no words, so absorbing it visually, um, your, your work is uh, very painterly. I don't know if that's a proper word to use, or, or, but your images are often very elaborate, and, you know, and when you say it took you five years, and it doesn't have to be an either or question, what I'm going to ask you, but in some ways, is story more important to you? Or is the beauty of the image is like, is the story kind of give you a vessel in which to then, you know, like you said, draw a glass of water in the most abstract manner possible? What, is there a chicken or the egg for you in this way? Yeah, it is a chicken and an egg question. Um, I find it's like a tennis match. You know, yeah. I usually start with an image in the arrival. So there's that particular image um, of the harbour scene, which is like a, a very New York kind of image. And I'd never been to New York, but I. You know, um, I'm familiar with that sort of imagery, and um, sort of a very dreamlike scene, and uh, very powerful in some way. And then trying to seek a story that explains that, mm -hmm. um, without being too specific, because you don't want to destroy the image by over-explaining it. Um, and then, uh, in other cases, I will just have an idea of a story and then I'll treat it as I did when I was an illustrator starting out illustrating other people's stories, I'll just go and illustrate it. And I'm very interested in um, other people's stories. I often feel I don't have many stories of my own um, and so uh, I like the idea, I mean, I'm like you guys, of illustrating someone else's story, it's something about, um, something about distance from the subject matter that helps you to recreate it using your imagination. Um, and then it expands it out for everybody else. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of either or. Sometimes I like the fact that, you know, when I'm painting, I just do a canvas and it's that painting is a story and that's it. You know, it doesn't have any, any subsequent images. It doesn't have any narrative around it. It's just a singular painting of a landscape and that is self-contained. So it's really whatever works. Okay. Um, something you just said, and now I'll open up the questions to all three of you, um, and it wasn't one of the questions I had prepared, but I was struck in hearing all of you speak. Uh, in my own work, um, to speak of myself, I tend to work very autobiographically. Um, even when I've written novels, I tend to take my own life and fictionalize it or draw upon myself. and you know, make it more absurd, or I take one element of my own character and blow it up into a, a, a whole fictional human being. But the three of you do seem to work more in a, you know, um, taking other people's stories, at least in the works I've seen and read, and bringing them to life. Have you ever considered working autobiographically, the three of you, or do you you know, if you want to address this issue of being able to, as you said, find expression through a distance of taking someone else's story and having distance from the subject matter helps the creativity. I don't know if you, uh, Emmanuel or David or Sean, want to address this question of working autobiographically or working with someone else's story. Um, uh, yeah, my answer to that. I, I think that working on biographies is a way to work on autobiography mm -hmm. in a hidden way, maybe. But um, I've, when I met Alan, for, the, for, for instance, who was the first person to whom I dedicated a, a biography, um, I knew at the time that I was in search of telling stories about life, but certainly not about mine. Um, I, I, could hide, I could hide myself in fiction, mm -hmm. but at the time I didn't want at all to evoke my own story. So when we met, it was like a very good timing, a good appointment, because he was 69 years old at the time, and he was like ready to pour his life into someone's ears, and uh, I was absolutely ready to listen mm -hmm. and to make something about it. So when I, he started to tell me about the California of, of his youth, 
uh, even though I had never been to California at the time. Um, of course, I recognize the, the quality of the air, the, the, the palm trees uh, around, because I've been raised up in the south of France, and uh, some of the landscapes he described me, they weren't that different from what I knew. And even though they would have been, uh, it, it was just the quality of his storytelling, his capacity of evocation, that uh, arose images in my mind. And obviously those images were made out of my memories, my own memories. And this is something beautiful about these cooperations between two persons, is that someone is telling you his memories and you're building up the images with yours. And uh, when you offer him, uh, which is a strange thing, his memories drawn by you, um, if he plays the game, that means if he leaves you a certain space of freedom to add things that belong to you, obviously. Uh, most of the time, what you draw doesn't look exactly like what he, have lived. he has lived, of course. But from time to time, you reach that point, very puzzling, in which some images he hasn't described you very precisely, are precisely uh, appearing in your work and I'm not talking about medium stories etc but I think when one listens very carefully to one another you reach together a certain point of uh, I don't know how to say it without being too bombastic or <laughs> but some sort of universality of uh, the human experience the first experiences of the cold, the hot, the, the, the sunset, the, the dawn, the etc., which belongs to every one of us. And when you draw them, and when you offer them to someone else, he, if it's neatly done, if it's sincerely done, he obviously recognizes his own experience. So I have this, I have this feeling, with this deep feeling, that most of the problems that we have to face in life come from the fact that we don't listen enough to each other and, uh, and, and that we don't know how to express properly to each other. So the, the, these books I have made were really consciously like an attempt to listen to someone else at a point that in the end the one who tells the story is, is indifferent. Him, me, it's, it's it's just about the same. We've ju we just fell agree on um, how to represent a, a lifetime. And this took time. We need time to, to become friends and to become really um, close to each other. So that, that's what all these stories are, are about. I think it's the same for David and Sean. Uh, we are persons who the pressure may be stronger in the movies, but uh, we are persons who have to take time to achieve what we want to do, and uh, we accept that and we long for that in a certain sense. Uh, David, your thoughts on biography and uh, autobiography? I was uh, just enjoyed hearing Emmanuel. Uh, just it was amazing hearing again Emmanuel uh, talking about describing my experience <laughs> working on the film, so I, I don't have a lot to add to that, basically. Uh, it's, I think of it sometimes, the illustration is, is this elegant art of piggyback riding. Mm. You, you, you go to places um, on someone else's idea, but, but you are going there together. And, and uh, the other thing that I thought of now is just, um, uh, working on the film, we, were, we had stories from six or seven people. And we made a point out, like, the only one I met uh, was Ari, the, the protagonist. But there were stories of other, other men that we made a point out of. We, we, we tried not to meet them, not to talk to them personally. The, and just w watch the, their video interviews and try to reimagine their memories and their stories. And uh, it's amazing how open to suggestion memory is, just exactly what you were saying, that you show someone their own memory and, and they're willing to accept it. And another one of your terms is when it's sincere. And it's amazing how 
how basic and simple all these things are. And, and the strife in the work on Walter Bashir was to get a feeling of authenticity, knowing for sure that you're not going to be truthful, because it's made up. I couldn't even go to Lebanon to draw the, the, the landscapes. All I had are the, there are stories and photos from the internet. A very narrow hatch to watch, to, to, to peek at this world. So what we did, kind of, you draw on your own experience. And when, when you manage to conjure this kind of an atmosphere of an afternoon, or a dusty road, or um, how fear feels like, and, 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 it, and in general lines, it, it goes, it sits on a narrative of someone else, they're willing to accept it, even if you know for a fact that it doesn't look like that. It's just worked. All right, thank you. Um, I like that, um, and I'll, I'll move on to the next question and start with you, Sean, but I like what you've both touched upon, which is to listen and to be able to make art from listening. Uh, and, and then, but also this connection of listening and then drawing. It's kind of beautiful using, using your ear and your, you know, emotional empathy and then uh, to create images. Um, my next question, uh, and I'd like to be able to uh, address two questions, just keep in mind. Um, this would be first and then one more. Um, for me, um, I always, well, when I uh, write my books, um, I'm always uh, in dialogue with um, a book that I've loved um, and have admired. So what I'm talking about is influences. Like I wrote a novel and because I had, for years I've been reading P.G. Woodhouse, those of you who like Woodhouse. And I so loved Woodhouse that I wanted to, I wanted to make a book like he made, you know, to give pleasure to a reader the way he had once given me pleasure. Uh, with my graphic novel, The Alcoholic, um, I was influenced by this uh, wonderful graphic novel called Fun Home by Alison Bechdel and what she was able to achieve, you know, emotionally through comics and uh, also a little bit of R. Crumb uh, taking the works of Charles Bukowski. So I'm always, in my mind, have other artists in mind and am influenced by them, will steal from them, not directly, but in the way that all artists take from other artists. When Ken Burns did that wonderful documentary on jazz, I was always, um, all the, the musicians would, you know, if you had old interviews, like Miles Davis would say, so I heard something that Charlie Parker was doing, and then, you know, and then he took it through his own soul, his own embouchure, as it were, and then created something new. And then, you know, and then there'd be Charlie Parker saying, I heard Benny Goodman doing this, you know what I mean? And it was like a genealogy. So um, my question to you, because I'm sure there's fans of graphic novels out here and illustrators in the audience, but we'll start with you, Sean. Who are your artistic influences, or who are you communicating with when you make your work? Who shaped you? Uh, with, with the arrival, um, I can, there's, you know, there's always like a thousand, but I can name two, um, and because of my picture book background, um, they're picture books. One is The Mysteries of Harris Burdick by Chris Van Olsberg, which is a, a book that was published in 1984, I think, a um, series of black and white images with a, a a title and a, and a sentence, like a sentence that's been extracted randomly from a story, but um, there's lots of parts missing and no uh, continuity in the book. It's just one dreamlike image after another. Could you, could you say the author's name again? In case Chris Van Olsberg. Chris, what? Chris Van Olsberg. Okay. Yeah. Um, should be quite well known uh, so here in the US. The yeah, um, a number of his uh, books have been adapted as film. Um, such as Jumanji, um, of course the book's always better. <laughs> um, oh, the one, one other thing, could we have the loop of the work on now? I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. You'll see everyone's work just sort of looping around, but continue. And um, so what I love about that book um, is its, its use of silence, its use of a carefully framed static image, um, its use of suggestion, and uh, the fact that you can't look at these pictures without coming up with a story, even the most reluctant imagination looking at these images feels compelled to explain it in some way because they are these little mysteries. Um, the second picture book would be um, The Snowman by Raymond Briggs. Mm. And uh, you know, I was struggling with the arrival for a long time, so when I say the book took five years, about one and a half of those years um, involved abandonment 
And um, it wasn't until I sort of came across this book, which is quite an old book, but I hadn't seen it before, um, about a boy who builds a snowman, the snowman comes to life and then comes into the house and the boy is showing this snowman all the wonders of an English domestic house, like light switches, detergent, um, the fridge, uh, which the snowman loves, and the oven, which he hates, and um, trying on the dad's clothes and all this sort of stuff. And it occurred to me that um, there were such strong parallels between that book and my own in sentiment, if not in subject, of somebody going into an ordinary space and finding it wonderful and challenging. Um, and, and also that book was completely silent, so I realised, you know, it's a perfect medium to express illiteracy. Um, and, and so I, was, I looked at that book a lot and that totally changed the course of the arrival. Um, it, it turned it into a comic in which the snowman is sort of halfway between a picture book and a, and a comic because he used multiple panels. And I really hadn't thought of that, using multiple panels. Mm. And so I started using multiple panels and um, here I am talking about comics. <laughs> but I um, never saw myself as a, as a comics artist or anything like that. I just saw it as the most logical way to tell this particular story. Okay, David, your, your influences or um, your artistic I, fathers? I, too many to or mention, mothers. but uh, it's, it depends on, on each project. I kind of I rediscovered it. There's this time when between, I think, the, the age of, between the age of six and 20, you kind of absorb and absorb and I... Uh, and even I, before? And even, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hopefully. Okay. And, I, and I find myself kind of uh, looking for uh, uh, things that, and, uh, and doing something that I think, oh, this is new to me. And then I remember that when I was 10, I was really into Japanese prints. So, oh, so I'm doing that now. So it's a lot of stuff for Walter Bashir. It's not really evident, but there was a lot of influence from not necessarily illustrators from a, a German post-expressionist painting, and it's kind of in the approach, not not exactly in the style. Works by people like, like Otto Dix, Christian Schad. It's mm -hmm. just this way of being at the same time realistic, naturalistic, and involved. C mm -hmm. keeping this kind of involved distance between you and what you're drawing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was looking a lot at their out uh, when working on Walter Bashir and uh, something about uh, the, the, the just technically the, the balance between the blacks and the, which is a little bit more expressionist German stuff. Mm -hmm. This is the recent influence. All right. uh, Emmanuel? Sean mentioned Raymond Briggs, and there's another beautiful book by him, uh, which is called Ethel and Ernest. Yeah, that really influenced yeah. me because it came That's out the fantastic. Same time, yeah. yeah, if you haven't read that book, it's a marvel. It's uh, it's just the biography of his two parents, the story of his family, and uh, they have been through the Blitz in London, etc. And he explains he was a child during the Second World War. He's been sent to the countryside, like most of uh, like the children who could do it in London did, and. Um, he, we see his parents aging till the moment they both of them die, and it's absolutely a masterpiece. So if you have a, an opportunity to set an eye on uh, Ethel and Ernest by Raymond Briggs, you, you'll make a wonderful travel. Um, obviously, we draw and we write because we have read, uh, and, uh, and very young, and if, if you a few years ago, a few months ago, a publisher asked me to for a contribution in a book, and I, I decided I would think about the influence that images have had on me between the age of zero and uh, six or seven years old, and uh, why, why I started drawing, and I, I started to reconnect as precisely as I could, as my memory allowed me to, with the, the very first memories of the drawing, the very first sensations, the, the smell of the, of the pens and the, 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 the noise of the cap that you just <laughs> like that, and uh, another noise, and, um, and the, the, the first lines. Uh, for instance, I remember as a baby uh, taking a blue pencil and making a blue line on the on the sheet of paper, white paper like that, and having really physically the impression that I was giving birth to an ocean or to a sky. And, uh, and then 
try to fill up the page and, uh, and being more and more disappointed because this guy would dig a hole in the page or, uh, or, uh, or would in the end appear very clumsy and, uh, and all these experiences of both uh, wonders, I mean, feeling like the master of the world and then frustration because not being able to reproduce what I had in my mind. These are all about the first lessons that we learn while by drawing. And I, most of the drawers, I think, even though they don't write, they are naturally born uh, as storytellers. Uh, when, when we draw, we, we, tell, we tell a story, we, we say something. So these two activities, they are closely linked. And uh, I've, I've been so influenced by so many, so many people, but um, for the two special works we we're talking about today by, that I've made, uh, Alan and the photographer, uh, I've always liked the conversations in book. Uh, for instance, the, the book of conversations that Eckermann has dedicated to Goethe uh, is uh, absolutely fantastic because it's a man who decides at a time, of course, where tape recording did, didn't exist to become a, a, a living tape recorder and uh, he would rush home every evening after a day of conversation with Goethe and try to, to be as faithful as possible to what he had learned. And I remember that when I read that, I was at the end of my teenage and uh, I said, uh, I thought, well, this is a discipline. And uh, I tried every time I had uh, an interesting conversation during the day to come back home and to be as literal as possible and try to find really the, the words, the patterns that the person had used. But when I met Alan, the first converse, conversation we had, uh, in the beginning I felt I'm going to do the same. I'm going to listen to him very carefully and this evening I write down everything I heard during the day. But he was so singular. He has a way, he, he, he has been living in France from 48 till 94, the moment I met him, uh, without coming back to America. So he spoke a very nuanced and beautiful French, but the way the, the foreigners do, uh, in a poetical way, with some, uh, obviously some words he had learned in literature and not in conversation. And uh, so it was, um, it was just impossible to remember all of these words. So I had to, to say, we have to tape. Absolutely, because I really want to have the, as we see in France, the letter of what you've said. And, um, but this, this came also from a, a book which has been, I guess, a big shock for all of us, and it's Mouse by, by Arch Spiegelman. And um, when it appeared, it's been a, a huge shock for uh, lots of my friends in, the, in the, my profession. And it still remains, I mean, it's a, it's a mountain. And the way he, suddenly the way after, I don't know how many hundreds of pages of uh, telling, he, he places at the very end the photograph of his father, uh, after having seen him as a mouse during the whole story. I guess we can find something in, of that in the work of uh, Ari and David in, uh, in uh, Walls with Bashir, because in, in the very end there, there are these images, and it obviously I, it's, it's been a big uh, influence on me also, and I guess maybe Sean would, would say the same. So that's names yeah, that we can Sean. drop. <laughs> okay. um, thank you. I, I, all those, uh, that was very interesting, everything that you all said. Um, my last question before I open up to Q&A, it's um, maybe a strange question or, or too vague a question, but um, kind of in keeping with Penn's mission, uh, you know, in protecting writers and literacy, um, I sometimes wonder about one's role as an artist in society and what am I doing and what am I con contributing and is there any meaning? And then I often take solace in the fact that the world has always needed clowns, you know, and I see myself as a clown even if I'm trying to write a good sentence or tell a, you know, a powerful story, that my goal is to entertain 
and amuse and that perhaps this helps the human condition somewhat. On a more selfish level, I like to make art because I like to make things and I like to use myself. George Bernard Shaw, you know, I wrote something about we should use ourselves like a, 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 a light bulb that goes until it burns out. So th those are some of my motivations, but I was wondering, and I'll throw it out, whoever would like to answer first. I mean, you, um, Alan and David, you've, you know, addressed the subject of war, obviously, you know, huge questions for society. Sean, at least in the arrival, the question of immigration and alienation and people moving and being accepted by a culture or not. So anyway, this uh, uh, a large ramble, but if any thoughts are provoked of how you see yourself as an artist in society and, and what, what is your raison d'etre or how do you keep going in, in this mad world and making art? Um, well, I can, I can start by um, saying that um, uh, my background in terms of, of visual art was in uh, uh, studying fine arts at uh, theoretical and academic level, so that's what I studied at university rather than um, I haven't studied illustration formally, but I've studied fine arts and especially, um, you know, the history of avant-garde art. And uh, one thing that um, sort of, I guess, bothered me slightly um, about the the attitude of, or the ideology of, of much of the fine arts world was the, the self-indulgence of it, um, which on one hand is what you need, you know, you really need self-indulgence um, and that honesty, you know, of your work. Uh, to get anywhere, sort of a personal obsession. But at the same time, it can be a little frustrating, this idea of art for art's sake. That, that does bother me slightly. I feel it's totally justified, but not enough. You know, that if you have a, a talent or some ability to communicate in a, in a very pre precise or emotive way, then it should be used um, to communicate to people. I feel the world is full of so much garbage in terms of communication, that if you can come up with something that's quite pure and meaningful and, um, you know, universal, you know, like the point of intersection for all our thoughts that's able to then open up and, and move on to something positive, then there is some responsibility there. I mean, it's an interesting question, the artist's responsibility. Um, but, uh, yeah, I personally feel that there, there is a responsibility, but on, on the other hand, you should never do a book because you feel like you've got a cause. I feel that's a pointless exercise. It has to be personal. It has to come from, um, yeah, some personal motivation. Uh, I can never sort of work to a theme or a political position. I always just respond to personal stories. David? I think that uh, Sean mentioned, I think, the, the key word for me, that, and that's uh, to be honest. Um, because in, in I find that with time, the, the more um, I'm in tune with what I really think about something and what really interests interests me in in a certain work, um, the better the work is received. Mm. When you're not trying to force yourself. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think that um, it, it's it's not about uh, making statements. It's about. Um, it's about making, I think, some kind of sense of things that most people know and feel. Kind of, it's about the uh, arranging the, the the feelings and the data in a, in a way that that is later digested by the reader, viewer, listener, and um, it's and and you can only do that when you're when you're honest, when you're not kind of trying to be someone else, and and, and we're we are very similar, all of us. So. And this is when I enjoy art. It's it's usually not this kind of you know lightning uh, striking me and giving me a message or uh, this revelation or anything. It's just this feeling. Yeah, that's right. This is exactly what it feels like. Or yes, this is this is someone managed to to formulate something that is familiar to well, is human basically. And I think that's the responsibility. And it's never a statement. I think it's never. Okay, this is good and this is bad, something. Yeah. Well, that, that makes me think of the, I guess, the, the Greek notion of catharsis. Yeah. That if we experience art and we feel something and it puts us in touch with our humanity, that somehow we're improved. 
um, which seems to be a Darwinian goal of humanity to continue to adapt and at least uh, open our consciousness more and more to hopefully survive and be a less destructive species to <laughs> say something totally. I don't know, whatever, I'm just talking, but you know, <laughs> some of these things may make sense. Um, okay, I see one brave person in stripes moving forward, or leaving, perhaps. Oh no, coming to the microphone, very good. Ten dollars for you, prize, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this is a question more for Emmanuel and also for you, David, but both of your, both the film, well, it's the best year because I haven't read the book, and uh, Alan's War seem to be very specific in terms of place, and settings, and also a lot of the um, military um, accessories that go, and the uniforms and everything, and how do you keep yourself from getting bogged down in the visual reference and making sure that everything is correct when you're trying to more work with feelings and memories and stuff like that? So is this a question about documentation, about... Um... About your process, you know. Um... Oh, okay. When you're listening to someone, uh, images are spontaneously created in your mind. It's always the case. A conversation, it's like reading a, reading a book. It's, it's, it's always a movie experience. And um, that's one of the reasons why persons are so often disappointed by the adaptation in movies of a, a book they have read, because the words don't connect. I, Hergé, the, the father of Tintin, always mentioned this letter he had received from a, a child saying, I'm disappointed because the Capitaine Haddock doesn't have the same voice in the movies than in the books. <laughs> and uh, um, so when I was listening to my friend Alan, and uh, for Didier it was different because, as I told you, we were describing the images. We, we were um, looking at the photographs as he was uh, mentioned, um, describing the situation. But for Alan, he had this special skill to make images arise in my mind in such a way that I, it gave me an excitement, really a, a, a need to rush to my drawing table and to, to, to draw, uh, to try to find, to refine what he had, what I had seen the first time I heard his, uh, his words. And, um, but, the fact is, I wanted to evoke a very precise period in recent human history, which was the World War II. So even though I saw precise images in my mind, when it came to, the time came to draw them, I had to search for documentation because I wanted someone who had lived these events, or maybe a historian, not to find too many mistakes in my work. So I tried to find a style which wouldn't tie me up to the documentation. I mean, I didn't want every, every two features to have to check in a book if what I was doing was right. So you, I had to find a style which was simple enough not to oblige me to be too close to the truth. At the same time, documentation can also be very feeding in terms of forms for you. I mean, it's very useful to look at some books. First of all, because one of the main goals when we're, doing, when we're working on this kind of books is to learn things. I mean, I mean, I do these stories because I have learned things by listening to them and I have learned things by treating their, their testimony and putting it into a book. So these, these first to, to learn things is also has to be satisfied by the work you do when you document yourself. And I must say that although I had seen before a lot of movies, as we have all done, about World War II and I and read a lot of books, the way that Alan described me this period and the, the work of documentation I had to do to be able to draw it, I guess made me closer than any other books or movies that I had seen before to the experience of these very young men of 20 years old, because wars are always made by kids um, uh, in these times. So that's how I use uh, documentation. I try to use it not too much, but enough for the story to be acceptable for the, for the, reader, for the reader and to, to, to look as real as possible. I guess, uh, again, 
describing my experience. Uh, but um, there's, uh, I think, using reference not to get to to tie down to to what you see in the pictures is um, it's, I think it's important to bear in mind that you are cre recreating atmosphere and feeling and this is the most important thing and everything else is secondary and, uh, and this and, and at the moment it, you can either have the idea of the atmosf atmosphere or the feeling you're trying to, to create in your mind and then use the reference or see how it feels in the picture and then work but it's not about the details uh, it's less about the details and I have kind of two examples of, you, you talked about military paraphernalia and stuff so looking at photos I, 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 you, you might notice that from the for Israeli soldiers in '82, they write their names on their gear because it would get lost, uh, and the way they wrote it with a thick marker, it, it, and you realize that this is what is needed to create this. So it's 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 most it's both personal and impersonal. It, they all look the same, but they have their names written on on their gear. So. And this is the very important detail, but it's much more important than the number of magazines they can load uh, or how many uh, water flasks they have. Or in another case, in a tank, I couldn't. I have the outside of the tank, but I couldn't get the inside reference because it's secret. You, you don't have the. So you get another tank, but what's important in it in the film, in the tank se the sequence, it's all wrong. You, it's one tank on the outside, and the, in the inside, it's 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 another. Machine, but but what I didn't realize, they have never been have never been inside a tank that it's dark there during the day, and they, and when you open the hatches, these are two kind of religious halos coming down, and that's important, much more important than how many light bulbs they have inside. Okay, and next question. Oh, it might be our last question. Sure. Um, Charlotte, it's a question for you. If I understood you correctly, you said that the um, the arrival began as a rather conventional story with words and then you dispensed with the words and then it got really weird. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could talk about that experience of kind of leaving language behind and did you have a kind of in the, in the, in the deep background a story that was in words that you were, you were telling about these very strange and beautiful images or were you entirely unmoored from language, and did that contribute to the the oddness and the otherworldliness of what you were creating? Um, it helped with the oddness. Um, it was pretty strange from the start. Um, so even when it had words, it was weird. Um, part of the uh, the idea of having words, like um, the original version of it, I mean, they were really brief statements, and I'm because I'm personally fascinated by. Um, the uh, inarticulate voices. Um, so somebody who tells a story in a very inarticulate way, um, whether th th for whatever reason, you know, um, and that behind those few words, um, like I lost my hat or something like that, um, or I couldn't get a job, there's this whole ocean of experience, but all you're seeing is this stone skimming across the top. And as an illustrator, then you can dip in and it's an entry point for the imagination. So my father, and my father's English is not perfect, so I'm used to having conversations with somebody um, who speaks in a way that's very abbreviated, and then I have to, you know, fill in the gaps. And so I, I, like, I like that um, relationship between word and image. So getting rid of the words, just the main reason for it actually I felt was to make the experience longer because the, one of the problems I have with words is that it's got a, a set metre or pace and um, uh, also people look at images these days very quickly, you know, um, and I kind of almost wanted a 19th century kind of viewing where people look, used to look at pictures I think a lot longer. Um, you know, like for instance, they would have a showing of a painting um, behind a curtain the way you'd have at a, at a cinema. People would pay money to go in and stand in a room and they open the curtain and everyone would look at this picture for an hour. Um, that's an interesting way of viewing and it's closer to the way of, that we draw because it's a very slow process. So um, the absence of language is really a way of slowing things down, not so much of making things weirder, but just sort of slowing things down so that you could appreciate the weirdness. So you wouldn't just go, oh, that's some funny walking tadpole um, or whatever. You'd actually go, what is that? And it's never answered. The lack, constant lack of answer 
um, I found fascinating right up to the end and there's still no answer and then you just sit back and go, well, that's what a lot of life is like. It's just a whole bunch of stuff that happens and there's no real answer to it. Um, so it felt very truthful to me. And the last point to make is just that um, in terms of a written reference, my written reference was um, a file full of migrant stories and my own notes. So um, I read lots and lots of migrant stories. Um, got a lot of stuff from um, Ellis Island as well as um, Australian sources and just made notes and then I grouped them into themes. So these are stories about food, these are stories about work, these are stories about um, climate and uh, stuff like that and that's, that's how I proceeded to structure the book. Okay, what I would like to do now is if you could come forward and ask your question, sort of like what Sean said, and we won't answer it, but I think it'll be interesting to hear the question, because otherwise I was going to be wondering, what was she going to ask? So <laughs> ask that question, we will all answer it in our minds, but also, um, after you ask it, I'll, I'll say a few things, and, but the authors will be up at the tables in the back signing books, and then they perhaps can answer your question. But let's hear it, though, because otherwise I'll be too curious and feel OCD the rest of the day. Okay. My question is a yes or no answer, so would you be able to say yes or no if I, if I ask it? Okay. That okay. Seems, that does, we do have time for yes or no. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, so The Arrival is a masterpiece. I, I think it's just a masterpiece. Um, you said it took like four or five years to make. Were you funded from the beginning or did you make it on your own dime or? Uh, the answer is no. I had um, an advance of uh, $2,000, Australian dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like it would last five years, right? No, no. <laughs> All right. Well, Thank that you. Was, you're welcome. Um, all right, so let me just read what I have to read at the end, and then I'll make the noise, and then the authors will be in the back. Okay. Can we go first? <laughs> you you want to make the noise? Or we can all make it together. Um, well, I wasn't sure what you meant by that, but I'm just aware of the time, but, you know, I think was, uh, the audience seemed to like it. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming today. If you'd like to buy books, the authors will be in the back and they will sign them. Um, there's still two days of events, so you can go to www.pen.org, find out more of what to do, um, and for uh, all sorts of things, pen.org. And I want to thank Cooper Union for having us. And uh, before I make the noise, let's have a round of applause for Sean Tan, David Polanski, and Emmanuel Brivert.